This is episode 155. I'm Pete Dominic. I'm glad to be alive. Let's do this. Hey, hello and hi. Welcome to episode 155. How was your day yesterday? Did you have a good day? What the hell's going on with you? I have had a lot happening in my life. Mentioned yesterday that I was uh, having some struggles, some tough times. I put it out there as much as I can and try to be as transparent and, and real as I can with you and honest as I can with you because I want to be able to relate to you and I don't feel shame for really anything anymore. I just want to be honest because I feel like when I am honest that I get so much good coming back to me. And several of you reached out to me because I made a subtle reference to just having some ups and downs. And it was it's really interesting what's happening here, this dynamic, this, as I call it, parasocial relationship, as I develop a relationship with so many of you that I am communicating with you in uh, often, you know, kind of intimate ways, saying personal things and you to me. And I love it. I think it's great. I'm fine with it. Most people who are in broadcasting don't really talk to the listeners or the viewers in in the same way and take down these walls but I haven't had an issue with it I haven't had anybody make me feel uncomfortable or annoy me everybody is just kind and thoughtful and respectful and funny it's like having a whole bunch of friends and so a few of you reached out to me and I thank you very much for it and I talked to each of those folks a little bit about what was going on and uh, really helpful. And so because it's uh, somebody else in my life that's struggling and, and why I'm struggling as a result, you know, you just can't really talk about it on the podcast, but I've I've talked to people privately about it and it's interesting and awesome to get your feedback and your thoughts and folks being able to relate to each other with any number of our several types of different struggles from health to money to relationships, career, purpose, existential dreads, pandemics, climate changes, and fears of the dentist. But the problem that I'm struggling with right now that I want you to help me solve is how do I create this relationship for more of you between, between each other? who listen to the program. So here's what I want to do. I'm going to lay it out. I think, I think I need some music. I'm creating a community here. I created a community at Sirius XM. I wasn't trying to, I wasn't setting out to, I was, I set out to do a thought provoking, entertaining, informative program. That's what I set out to do. And I think I accomplished that day in and day out. I'm really proud of what I did there and who I worked with and what I learned. And I've now taken that same goal here to the podcast, except for something, I guess, unexpected happened over those 14 years at Sirius XM. I created a community of people. Like I said, I wasn't setting out to do that, but it's inevitable that a daily radio program, which was as personal and honest and intimate and funny and thoughtful as the one that I worked on and built, would create a community of listeners. Every radio show does that. Every TV show does that, really, but especially terrestrial radio, and now I think podcasts, because you it's inevitable that you create a community of people who listen. My, I want to take it further. And so my idea is to create a community online that partners with the podcast. And so basically what I want to do is build something similar to Facebook for people who listen to the show so it's not just me who gets to benefit from your wisdom and humor and thoughtfulness and kindness and vulnerabilities dealing with your lives and sharing them with me and then sometimes taping them and sharing them with everybody which i wish i could have more time to do but i you know i I do it every day i work several hours every day to make it work but what if it, it was available to you Anytime you wanted, 24-7, online. This community. And so I have an idea. I'm just going to keep talking it out. And if you want to help me build this, then keep listening. And if you want to get to my guests, then skip ahead. Great guests today. 
Mark Preston on the show for the first time. Very excited. We had an awesome conversation. And a, a first time guest ever, also, Judith Matlock. So you're going to love her as well. We had a, She's fantastic. Both of them are. Great show. But here's what I want to do. And I definitely want your help. I want your buy-in. I want your contributions. Right now, there are several listeners that have helped me with the actual studio build. I'm building a studio outside in my yard because nature is my religion. And I'm big into gardening. We have a Facebook group, by the way, if you're into gardening. Love to see your pictures and your stories. It's all gardening. It's the stand-up gardening club on Facebook. I always forget the name of the <laughs> the group I created on Facebook. Stand-up garden club, isn't it? Isn't that what it is? Oh, man. So, where did the music go? Okay, get it back here. It is. What does this look like, this online community it looks like literally a big board where you you have space on that board you can put your name your picture you can have a profile or you could just put up a leaf you don't have to be out about who you are and 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 open it could just be everything just needs to kind of be trending towards the positive helping people so if you just want to put up a picture of a leaf and then a thoughtful quote when people click on it, because that's how it works, then fine. If you want to put up your profile and post your podcast or your show or your business or service product, fine. If you want to post up an article or a video, great. Whatever you want to do. But basically, imagine in your mind's eye a big board with a whole bunch of different images, logos, brands, names, photographs. It's a it's a it's a mess of pixels and you can just go through and you can click based on whatever you see or whatever it says and it'll flip and then it'll be whatever you want my name judith i live in louisiana i am a lawyer and i am struggling with not only the pandemic but my divorce i just made that whole person up by the way that was a mismatch of actual people that i talked to in the show and the only one I can think of right now, well, Judith is an actual person's name, and then Louisiana is attributed to Jason Mo. <laughs> and nobody has reached out and said they're struggling with a divorce right now. I don't think. Anyway, that's the idea. Do you have technical skills? Do you build websites? Do you build communities online? Do you think this is a stupid idea? Do you know where the music went? How's uh, this? Where does it live? That's a good question. It'll be up behind me, maybe on all of my videos that I broadcast from there, and I can have it in everything I do. But I want to build a community, and I want to build it with you. I want to build it with you. I want you to help me. I've got people helping me build this shed. I want people to help me build this community, and I want it to be a positive thing in your life because so many of us are so alone, so often not around other people. And that was the truth before the pandemic began, before we started quarantining. There was an epidemic of loneliness. I am not going to die of loneliness. I am not going to, I don't want to be disconnected from the world. Some people do. And some of you, by the way, you just want to listen to this show. That's totally fine. Thank you. Psyched to have you just listening to the show. But if you want to go deeper and meet more people and, I mean, amazing people, amazing people, I mean, the people, sorry, then please share your ideas with me because I want to get this going. I want to start this up. I want to create a community that partners with this podcast and that is available online 24-7, like a support group, but just people helping each other buying each other's services, maybe products, maybe, I don't know, maybe someone will will meet and get married through this idea. Wouldn't that be amazing? That'd be cool. It could be a matchmaker. So, let me know what you think. Email me and in the subject, put stand-up community if you want to weigh in on this, if you have any ideas at all. And if you think this is stupid or somehow, like, uh, I don't know, anything, anything, I'm open to all of it. All of your criticisms, all of your ideas, 
all of your great feedback. So many kind compliments coming from new subscribers to the show. Thank you so much. I'm so happy that the show means so much to so many. It is filling me with joy and purpose each and every day to be able to share my conversations with these expert guests, find new people, read their stuff, prepare to interview them, and make them feel comfortable in this space, and then share those conversations with you. So, let me know. Stand up with Pete at gmail.com. Stand up with Pete at gmail.com. And in the subject, put stand up community and share with me any ideas or any ways that you have to help build this. And let's go. Let's get this going. It's going to be a real positive thing in our lives if you want it to be. Come on. Who's with me? Who wants to do this? Email me stand up with Pete at gmail.com. Put stand up community in the subject. And now. My first guest today is a journalist who has reported from all over the world, including in conflict zones in Angola and in Colombia. She is a professor as well of journalism, and she has written several books. But today we're talking about her new book. It's titled How to Drag a Body and Other Safety Tips You Hope You Never Need. Survival Tricks for Hacking Hurricanes and Hazards Life Might Throw at You. From Cybersecurity Active Shooter situations and travel to natural disasters emotional resilience my guest judith matloff shares tips that will give even the most anxious person a sense of control over life's unpredictable perils and isn't that what we need right now we got deep here we got uh it's she was great she made me feel a lot better about things and i don't want to do a segment like that like this uh to scare anybody i want to help you work through these things confront the things that you're worried about prepare in your mind for them so if uh, they ever happen that you can know how to deal with them and get centered here now my conversation with judith matloff i i wish i'd hit record before you said you were flatter but now i have hit record so you could say it again <laughs> judith columbia journalism uh, uh pr- professor uh conflict journalist author very happy to have you joining me really excited to talk to you Wow. Well, I'm very honored to be here. This is fantastic. Wow. One Great. of the one of the um, reasons that I, I want to talk to you is, yeah, you, yeah, I could talk to you, uh, someone like you forever for like 15 hours because you've had such an amazing career in life and you're so smart. And this book. Mm. Uh, is great. And I've already, you know, plugged it and talked about it and, and and so on. But before I started with you, but I really was interested in this part of your book and your work specifically about uh, gender violence when it comes to journalism. And of course, this is a book about being prepared. But I thought that that was really an, an important and interesting section. And it really kind of put me over the top. Not that I wouldn't have interviewed you anyway, because there's so much good stuff in this book. But why is that something that you devote a chapter, an entire chapter to hashtag me too and rape in a book about preparation for uh, dangerous things? Well, um, women, not just journalists, just women in generally, generally face more um, sexualized cyber harassment than men. With men um, who do get harassed, digitally and in social media, it usually has to do with ideas or, I, or you know, what they believe in, things they've said. With women, it gets really nasty and dirty. You know, women are called hordes. They get threats to be raped. Uh, they're told that they're fat pigs, et cetera, et cetera. So oftentimes the har- harassment that women get due to the nature of their work or just due to who they are is really, really sexualized. And one thing that really has concerned me with my colleagues, but it also affects women you know, who aren't journalists, is doxing, which um, I don't know if your li- listeners are aware of that, but that's when your personal information is made public and posted on social media without your permission. Right. So your address, your telephone, number, the name of your kids, the name of your spouse, et cetera. And that's where it gets really, really awful because cyber harassment is very, very distressing, but this spills over to physical harassment. And I've had colleagues who have had people dox their information and then people have come to their home and they've shined laser lights into their living rooms. They've thrown rocks at them. They've stood out their windows and screamed at them or just stared at them. And it's scary. It's really, really scary. And it's a threat. What do you have you ever had to deal with that in your career? And what is the advice that you have about preparing for it, combating it? Um, 
Yeah, I have not been doxxed basically because I only joined Twitter about two months ago. So I'm waiting. I'm waiting. <laughs> and it was Facebook, <laughs> again, I mean, you know, it's funny because this book is all about staying safe and keeping yeah. a low profile. But to promote it, I had to get on Facebook and Twitter. Um, but, you know, I'm waiting. I'm waiting. But in terms of generalized harassment, both on the job and just personally, oh, without a doubt, and I'm, I have faced potential rape, et cetera, mainly on the, you know, related to work. Um, In terms of doxing, the most important thing is to try to scrub the information which is out in the public sphere so that people can't get hold of it. So there's a company called Abine and they have a, um, it's something called Delete Me and it costs about $120 a year. And it's really, really worthwhile spending that money because they will scrub everything from, you know, you know, when you bought your car to, again, name the family members, where you live, telephone number, et cetera, et cetera. And it's really important that that stuff be scrubbed. The other thing for professional women, it's really important to keep your personal accounts separate from your professional ones so that the personal information doesn't seep into the professional sphere. And I, you know, what we teach journalists is as a general rule, just don't um, put any personal information out on Facebook. Uh, You know, there is, Mm. obviously it's a great way to bond with everybody, but it's also a great way for other people to get information about you. Yeah. I know a few journalists who have had that issue and uh, it's it's really complicated because you want to put yourself out there so you can get, sources and so people can contact you but you don't before all the reasons that you just mentioned so before you read this uh, wrote this book obviously you've written other books you've had a a phenomenal and and fascinating career it seems uh where you have found yourself in some very challenging scary terrifying situations uh can you tell me a little bit about that because i think that folks will will you know obviously you you have the credibility to be writing this book because of what happened in Angola because of what happened in Colombia yeah i mean uh, angola was kind of my wake up call it was 1992 and there was supposed to be an election that was going to change the history of the country from 35 years of war to peaceful democracy um what happened is the head of the rebel movement jonas adimbi lost the election And he decided that he was going to go back to war. And uh, the problem was I knew him and his henchmen really well. And so when I started writing fairly critical pieces about the fact that they were sending the the country back into war and destroying it, um, they didn't like that. So so they threatened to kill me. And uh, so then he sent his number two, who told me personally that they were after me. So that was kind of creepy. But the problem was I hadn't done any preparation. It hadn't occurred to me or my bosses that the country might slide back into war and that maybe I needed training. So suddenly I'm in this place. These people are threatening me and they know me personally, which is kind of a little creepy. And then there's fighting going on at the airport. So the airport closed. And the United States at that point didn't have diplomatic relations with Angola. So there was no embassy that could evacuate me out. Right. You know, the Navy SEALs weren't going to be coming in because, right. you know, they didn't have presence. And um, let's see, what else happened? Columbia. Oh, yeah, I didn't know anything. Well, well oh, you're, not, you're not done with Angola. Yeah, I'm yeah, sorry. No, no, wait, there's more to this. Yeah, I'm sorry. Go ahead. <laughs> so this is crazy. I to, yeah. I mean, I was really stupidly unprepared. I mean, when I think about it, this is kind of what led me on the path of today and eventually to, to do this book. So the other thing, which was really insane, was that I had – a satellite phone, one of the very first models. And um, I didn't realize that when the power goes off, it surges when it goes back on. So this equipment is my only link with the outside world because there are no landlines that work there. And this predates cell phones. And sure enough, you know, I left the thing plugged in overnight. There was a blackout. The power surged back on and I blew out my $10,000 communication with the outside world. So that was pretty bad. Then it gets even worse. <laughs> I mean, really, like if my when my mother heard about this 30 years later, she was like, and I trusted you, you know, like you did. <laughs> OK, so what happened was so and then what happened was like I didn't know anything about warfare or shooting. Right. Because I was mainly a financial journalist at that time. And I ended up in the middle of this war. So I thought that when people shoot, you as a journalist should go to the scene of the shooting and check it out and get as close as you can. 
Well, um, I think most people realize you're not supposed to do that. So I got into some really close calls there. It just goes on and on and on and on. Um, so that was Angola. <laughs> well, I mean, I, you're, you're also you're you're listing you're, you're basically making the case as to why someone like you should write this book, because what the mistakes that you made and the, the lack of preparedness led you to a career, I guess, that maybe you weren't planning for, but that uh, where you were teaching people how to prepare for for things. But now the uh, mainly journalists. But now this book is basically how all of us should prepare for things uh, the way that journalists do. Is that fair to say? Oh, it's totally fair to say. And the way I came to the book was once people got wind that I was doing um, doing training for journalists going into dangerous situations, suddenly like ordinary people like my sister's social worker, you know, she's going down to Puerto Rico uh, to visit family there. She's married to people who have family there. And um, it's like, well, what do we do about Zika? You know, how do we mm. how do we guard against that? Or, you know, there's a category five <laughs> hurricane that's probably coming that way. What do we do to prepare? And then a, a friend whose daughter was spending her junior year abroad in Jordan wanted to know what should she do so that she doesn't get kidnapped or raped. And so I'm getting all these or like after the Equifax thing, my mother's elderly friends, all these people in their 90s, like, you know, how do we protect our um, our assets and our finances and our banking transactions so we don't get hacked. So I'm getting all these queries from ordinary, normal people who don't put themselves in harm's way. And I'm thinking, like, why don't I just write a book and just put it all down there? Because this stuff is pretty useful to everybody. Well, we're so glad that you did. The book is fascinating and important. And, you know, I I, I was got to be careful about these kind of conversations and issues because I don't want to panic people. I don't want to panic myself. I don't want to be irrational, but I still, I mean, make the case for why just being prepared will, will make you less anxious and less irrational and less likely to make mistakes in an emergency because most of us really aren't prepared for most things in life, much less the things that you talk about in the book. Yeah, no, absolutely. But the fact is, we're living at a time of extreme climate change where yep. uh, massive wildfires, hur- you know, uh, category five hurricanes are happening at increasing um, in increasing intensity and frequency. We're living in a world where our kids might be shot at school. We're living in a world where we go to a concert and suddenly a mass shooter appears and guns down people in the audience. We're living in a world where you go to a demonstration and suddenly it turns violent. We're living in a world where cyber security is really an issue for every civilian. We're living in a world where just getting on an airplane right now opens you up to the chance of contracting uh, COVID-19. So again, I don't want to freak people out. There are dangers swirling around, but if if you actually sit down and consider and contemplate the worst case scenario. What would be the worst thing that could happen to you danger wise? And then you evaluate, is it really likely? And if it could be likely, what can I do to mitigate that risk and cope with the eventuality of that event? You're actually going to feel far more in control than if you have a kind of vague anxiety in the back of your head that you're trying not to think about. And I'll give you this yeah, and I'll give you this one COVID nineteen example sure. of why it's so good to be prepared for eventualities. So, because my husband, who's also a journalist, and I have lived in all these kind of crisis oriented places, you know, I've worked in Mexico, we were we met in Africa, we we lived in the former Soviet Union, you know, kind of places where things happen all the time. We just buy, we just always have a spare amount of cash in the house, just in case there's a run on the banks. Where do you we keep it, and what is your address? Oh, <laughs> you're going to dox me now. <laughs> no, I'm just going to come take that cash. <laughs> it's in a fireproof safe, and I keep forgetting the combination. So I can't help you <laughs> That's not preparedness. That. Yeah. So yeah, and um, yeah, and we we always have like a uh, like a month's supply of medical supplies, and I'm talking about like kind of more than just prescription drug, you know, non-prescription drug, you know, medical supplies in the house. We know how to use them. We know how to tie tourniquets and all that business. We always have a month's supply of non-perishable food and water. We just have that stuff in the house. We have spare batteries. 
because you just never know. And we just keep it there. Like it took a few hours to assemble all the stuff. We stuck it in the basement. That's that. Okay. So COVID comes to town. My husband is in Europe on business. I'm upstate at a writer's residency. Our son is at college in California. COVID comes to town in New York City and none of us are here. Meanwhile, every New Yorker, like 8 million people are running around. They bought all the masks. They bought all the wipes. They bought all the gloves. They bought all the lentils, you know, whatever. Well, by the time the three of us got back to New York, the pandemic was in full throw. But we were okay because we already had all that stuff in the basement. We even had N95 Mm. masks. Mm. So, you know... I think they were left over. We did a lot of construction projects. My son spent some time in China. And then we thought, you know, it's just good to have these things lying around. They're just really handy things to have in the house. And um, so they were just, everything was in the house. So we got back to town. Obviously, we we were anxious about COVID since, you know, New York became the epicenter globally. But we had all the supplies in the house. So we didn't have to, like, go to a, you know, a drugstore and look at empty shelves. So, I mean, that's just one tiny example of why it's really good just to have that stuff in the house. Another thing I think everybody should have is an emergency, um, it's called an NOAA radio, a hand-cranked emergency radio. Oh, really? What it is is in case, yeah, there's a weather situation, i.e., you know, a natural disaster, you um, you have this hand-cranked, really small radio. It's like smaller than the size of like, you know, cereal box. And you don't need batteries because it's hand cranked. You don't need to plug it into a power supply. It has a USB port. It has a flashlight on it. And it will receive all emergency alerts from whoever the emergency people are, be it FEMA or, you know, your governor or whatever. It's just why not have it in the house, right? Well, I'm looking at them and and I'm going to buy one right now, but I'm going to buy the one that has a USB port so you can charge the phone, too. Yeah, because uh, it's hard to charge your phone when the power goes down. Yeah, I mean, you can put it in and your the car. Power but... goes... Yeah. Well, maybe if your car's not submerged in water. Uh, good the way point. I think. <laughs> but yep. your car will always have a filled tank of gas. Exactly. Right? No, well, it right, should. Pete? Well, oh, you're saying you're insinuating. Uh, yes. Yes, it will. Mine, I, I think I, <laughs> we're, I've been pretty good at that in my life, but. But that's a good point. That's all another sign of preparedness. Um, yeah. And I'm, the other thing I do, it's partially because I'm lazy. And uh, before COVID, I used to travel all the time for work. So I always had a bag pack. It was like my go-to bag or, you know, my, my you know, go, go away bag. And it was always packed with, you know, a certain number of garments. It always had a medical kit. It always had, you know, a, a spare phone, blah, blah, blah. It was always packed. So whenever I would get a phone call from somebody like three in the morning, like get to Burundi, the bag was already packed. And then this became a habit. And so I kept it always packed, even for vacations to visit my husband's family in the Netherlands. Like the bag was always there. And it's a really helpful thing to have in case of emergency, because, you know, if you got to get out of Dodge because there's a wildfire, your bag's already just get, you know, just throw it in the car or, you know strap it on your back or whatever. And again, I mean, it takes so little time to put this thing together and it really doesn't take that much money either. And why not? Why not just have the go-to bag ready? Uh, You mentioned uh, having antibiotics uh, uh, and different types. And you also said that you can generally get your doctor to prescribe them, which I was surprised by because I always thought they were pretty cagey about that because of the issues surrounding them. What's the deal with antibiotics and why should you have them? Um, well, you might get sick. (laughs) Uh, Yeah. (laughs) And if there's an emergency, particularly if you're traveling abroad, like you don't want to go to like some local pharmacy, you know, you may not, it may be hard to get a prescription. They may be, you know, it may like have expired, like, you know, but the thing is most doctors, if you explain why you want it, which is for travel or emergency, in my experience, hundred percent, they will, they will dispense them. And in this uncertain world that we live in, I think doctors are really happy to oblige people who are very anxious about things. It's not like an opioid, which you might abuse. Like, you know, you're not going to take penicillin recreationally. (laughs) Well, I mean, you say that, but if you get real hungry and it's late and it's all you see, (laughs) a friend of mine has 
popped a few just as a snack. No, it's a really, yeah. And I have, uh, speaking of friends of mine, I have doctors who listen. So maybe someone can write that script for me, but good advice. Great advice. I wanted to ask you about another chapter in your book that I I thought was very important and maybe not that obvious for you to put in here. And I'm glad that you wrote about it. I'm glad that you had the, um, the understanding as to, you know, and experience as to why you should. It's, I think the last chapter it's uh, titled mental armor and emotional resilience. And you're basically saying here that you can't control the catalyst, the tragedy, uh, the accident, the what, the shooting, whatever it is, but you can control your response. What should we do if we find ourselves in a crisis moment? It's it's interesting because of all the chapters in the book, um, this is the one that's resonating with people the most right now because I think everybody can relate to it. We all feel pretty crappy at the moment with this COVID thing. You know, it's it's it's. It's open ended. We keep making adjustments in our lives, and then there's no end in sight. Mm. And for, you know, a lot of us have lost work. A lot of us have lost lost loved ones. Our kids can't go back to college. You know, there's so many changes to people's lives, and it's an awful time to live. So I think emotional resilience and um, and and a it just a durability is really important right now. The most important thing to maintain that emotional strength during very, very trying open-ended times is social connection and social support. This is what psychologists that specialize in disasters and war say. And certainly in my experience over the decades dealing with these conflict situations that are like COVID open-ended, you just don't know when it's going to end and the crisis seems to get worse and worse and drag on. The most important thing is to have a network of people on whom you can rely and who you feel very, very connected with. And, you know, the, hum- the human species is a pretty, um, I, you know, it's, it's, it's geared towards survival. So I think all those five o'clock Zoom cocktails, you know, despite that we, ain't, we all may be drinking too much of these things, it's actually a survival mechanism and it's very, very healthy. People are connecting the best way that they can. So that's very important. The other thing is physical fitness. Um, exercise is absolutely critical to emotional resiliency. So it's really, really important to try to build it in to, if not every day, most days right now, because it will help you sleep better. It will release endomorphins. It will just make you feel like you're more in control yes. of your situation. Yes, yes, You'll be yes. able to work off anxiety, eating well and sleeping well. So, you know, if you, and the other thing is that if you build up your physical strength, you also perhaps will have more physical um, resilience when it comes to fighting off the disease. If you're in good shape, uh, hopefully if you do contract the disease, your physical strength will help power you through in what, what's going to be quite an ordeal. So those are the two most important things. And then there's the third thing, which is for me, it's absolutely critical, which is gallows humor. I mean, I have to, when I'm in a situation that really freaks me out, which is pretty much everything, (laughs) um, I just, I just try to make light of it and look at the absurd because that way I get control over the situation. Like I'm not going to let this fucking COVID get the better of me. I'm just going to joke about it and I'm going to find something really ridiculous. Now this may not be the best survival mechanism for some people, but it works for me. And I think We all have to find our personal survival mechanism for other people. It could be journaling, just writing down really bad thoughts that makes you feel better. For other people, it could be um, meditation. I'm like one of these hyper people. I can't sit still for more than like one second. So Mm -hmm. meditation is going to work for me, but maybe it works for you or somebody else. So just find that one thing, spirituality, you know, for some people, just find that one thing which really anchors you. And just, you know, all these people getting COVID puppies right now. Yeah, that's that's yeah. A, that's survival mechanism. Yeah, yeah. Like, that's, again, yep. you know, get a puppy. You know, um, well, you know, we'll ask your mother first, <laughs> whatever. But, but you know, find out. You know, find somebody else to walk it. But get a puppy, get a cat. You know, whatever. I mean, whatever it is that's going to anchor you, do it. COVID and puppies or COVID people, kittens. Yeah, you know, or get a COVID kitten. Yeah, I'm more of a dog person, even though I have cats. But if you want my cats, by the way, you can have them. <laughs> again, we're going to need. So, we're going to need that yeah. address. Uh, yeah, they're yeah, really good. sweet. All they're very really nice. good advice. Really, really good advice. I mean, I I love the point about uh, humor. I think that's that's a very good, very good point. You don't hear that people say that very often. 
But uh, I'm always reminded of like Roberto Benigni with that, that movie, A Beautiful Life. I always think of the worst thing in the world being like the Holocaust. And how did how did people make it through that? And you think about Viktor Frankl's work. But but uh, but I, if you go back to that, they often use humor. People living in poverty, poverty and the worst situations use humor. So I'm so glad you include that as well. How about we debunk some myths like what you shouldn't buy and what you shouldn't do, like toilet paper or oh certain God. types of food that don't make sense. Uh, uh, what are some of the things that you see people doing, Judith, that um, your book and your your career is, is, instructs? No, don't do that. Well, this toilet paper thing, I don't understand. It's respiratory disease. Like, what's yeah, with I, the toilet paper? Oh, I thought you like, were going to have the toilet? answer for that. I don't know. I still no, don't know. It's like, it's like insane. Like, folks, stop buying toilet paper. I mean, like, have enough, but, like, this is ridiculous. Unless you I mean, like, eat there's it. water in your house. If you run out, like, I'd be more worried about running out of, you know, aspirin or something if I get the flu. But, right. like, folks, don't buy bales of toilet paper. Like, just buy enough, but, like, don't go overboard. And I think that's the important thing. Panic buying feels more panic. Just, and again, like, if you have, like, a month's supply of stuff in your house, then already you're not going to feel panic when the unthinkable happens. Um, so again, you know, it all comes down to preparation again of just, just to have some supplies in the house, have that little bag packed and already you're going to feel calmer. The, the other thing, which I think is really important is, um, if your finger gets cut off, don't put it on ice. I'm going to debunk this myth right now. People always think like, this happened to a friend of mine. He was, um, he was uh, jumping out of an airplane, what do they call it, parachuting, and his finger <laughs> got left behind. And when the airplane what? went back to, yeah, when the airplane, like, got back to Earth, somebody rushed and they put the finger on ice. And then, you know, they rushed it to the hospital with the man without the finger. And then the doctor said, dude, I, like, you killed the finger. What? Don't put, don't put severed limbs and intestines on ice. That's, that's a myth to debunk. It, they're not oysters. Uh, what you want to do is put them in like a Ziploc bag and keep them in a cool place. But like, don't, don't put the, oh, sorry, there's my phone. Um, but don't put them, you know, don't put them on ice, folks. Another thing is don't put cooking ingredients on a burn. You're always hearing about people putting oil or butter on a burn. Don't do that. Like those things belong in a salad dressing. They don't belong on your hand. <laughs> yeah. And also don't okay. put hydrogen peroxide. Oh, God. Oh, God, why would anybody do that? The other, the other myth, and I'm going to debunk this because everybody's going to protest these yeah. days, um, tear gas. Um, I see all these people walking around with leaf blow blowers. I don't think it's a good idea because it could be seized from you and then it could be blown against you. It, it doesn't necessarily blow in in the right direction if the wind changes. And another thing, you want to be really nimble and light of foot and you don't want to be carrying around an extra piece of equipment. It can destabilize your balance. It's another thing you have to start worrying about. Don't bring an umbrella. I'm sorry. Don't bring a leaf blower to a, uh, a demonstration. The other thing, this is a myth all around the world. You'll go to Iran, you'll go to Mexico, you'll go to um, Kashmir and you'll see people at demonstrations where there's tear gas carrying uh, bandanas soaked in in um, in lemon and vinegar and onions, and then they put it on their mouth. Well, that doesn't work. The 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 myth there is that it the acid in those substances neutralizes the acid of you know the the uh, abrasiveness of the um, of the tear gas, but that's just a myth. It doesn't do you any good. So leave those cooking uh, ingredients at home. The other myth is that you should pour milk or cream on skin that's been burned by pepper spray. Yeah. Uh, don't do that because pepper spray and tear gas have acids in them. And so, and the thing about dairy product products is they, they have acid in them as well. So it doesn't calm down your skin at all. It actually could make it worse. The one thing which does work is an acid like milk of magnesia. So you, you get a spray bottle. One third of it is milk of magnesia. The other two thirds is water. And that's what you should use to calm down the skin. But do not put it in your eyes. So these are just, I mean, the book has so many of these myths. 
you know. Yeah. They're, they're, anyway, I, you know, I could go on and on. Well, I uh, could talk to you forever, but I hear your phone ringing. You probably got to jump. And I already uh, I, I took up a lot of your time and I got the time wrong for people uh, listening. I screwed up the time with this prestigious author. I've um, oh, uh, been a little bit of a mess. To la- what do you do when your dog runs away when you're late to, oh. for an interview? You get the dog. The dog is a priority. Interview can wait. Oh. You know, the, the dog is the most important thing. I'm sorry. Life stops for dogs. I should have put that in the book, actually. Judith, I feel dogs like are- I'm just going to, now that I have your number, I'm just, I mean, I'm, I'm personally going to, <laughs> I guess it's not doxing you, but I'm going to reach out for every challenge in life. You seem to have an answer for no matter how specific it is. If a fingernail is, ah, uh, it's so great. Uh, thank you so much for talking to me. This book is so good. I'd love to do a part two uh, uh, once I've finished it. And uh, as we as we continue on here for a final question, I would like to ask you've been involved and in the middle of many conflicts, all types of conflicts. And there are stages to conflicts. I feel like and you touched on this earlier, but it's about how challenging this is for all of us. I've been talking with my listeners and friends and family about the, the last couple of weeks, especially last week, seemed to be a real breaking point. And I think it's because maybe some of us thought things would be different at this point and they've gotten only worse. I think it's because school is starting to begin in certain parts of the country and we're having that argument and we can talk about any number of other reasons. But is there any way for you to explain, uh, given your perspective, kind of what stage we're in and and how to deal with the fact that there doesn't seem to be an end in sight or as some have said, the worst is yet to come? Yeah, I mean – I think one thing which is, uh, you've really hit upon this, uh, something really important, and I've been talking about this with a lot of friends. Indeed, I think the return to school is, it's like, wait a minute, we thought everybody could go back to school. There's that, and there's also, I don't know where you live, I live in New York City, and the heat is unbearable. Yeah, I live in Rockland County, it's been brutal. Yeah. The the combination of beastly, beastly heat Mm. in the upper 90s, and then the kids who are kind of aimless, like my son is 19 and he can't go back to school and he was doing so well. He was doing brilliantly. He was like surprisingly resilient for a 19 year old, you know, hormonal person. Suddenly when he found out he couldn't go back to school, he crashed. And I think that's, um, I think we're all going through that. Yes. What we're finding just within our own family and with our friends, if you can find a project that you can sink your teeth into that makes you feel like you're swimming towards something. So, you know, for my son, for instance, he's working on his Dutch with his father now so that hopefully he can emigrate to, you know, he can, he can repatriate to the Netherlands and smart, not have in this country anymore. Uh, so he's working on his Dutch. He's going to work on his driving so he can get his driving license. And so we've got two things to swim towards, which are very positive and informative and make him feel that he's actually, he's got a plan of action. So if there's something that you can think of, even if it's just cleaning out that damn closet, something that makes you feel like you're moving forward on a small, even if it's just a small task or a big task, try to concentrate on that. Um, Maybe it's learning a new skill so that you can get a new job since you lost your job. Just anything, you know, getting an online credential, in, you know, something like food safety management, you know, I'm just thinking off the top of my head, but just something that makes you feel like you're powering forward. It's really, really useful at this time because the worst thing is to be treading water with anxiety and not knowing where we're going and feeling out of control. But if you have an action and a program, at least you feel like there's some momentum. So are um, you a journalist and writer or a therapist? Because this interview oh has God, been, no, I'm not a therapist, but I'm this... like the most neurotic person. I'm like the most neurotic. Often those are good family. therapists because they're so empathic <laughs> with our neuroses. Uh, yeah, I, I wouldn't dare. Uh, I don't know. <laughs> well, I feel like I, I just I ask because I feel a lot better having talked to you today. Uh, I've been having a, cu- a tough couple of days myself. And Aww. I really feel great having talked to you. And I'm, I, I think I'm, I mean, I'm definitely taking a lot of your advice. And right now I'm building a brand new studio and the next time I talk to you, hopefully I'll be broadcasting from that studio. That's my project that you just mentioned. And it's really, wow. it, it's over, it's a little, it's a, maybe it's a little bit too big of a project because it can be a little overwhelming, but it's, it's such great advice. Whether you're learning language, an instrument, learning a new skill for that new job or building your outdoor studio, uh, it's a, it, you, like you said, keep swimming forward. Um, that's such great advice. I just wanted to underscore that. And I'm so glad that we spoke today. Thank you so much. Yeah. 
Oh, it, it was a delight. Get me back on when you get your studio. Yeah, absolutely uh, will. I can't off. wait for part two when I'm done with the book. Go get the book, everybody. It's so good. And um, I will uh, plug it uh, more and more, put it in the show notes, put it on social media. And now that Judith is on social media, you can follow her on Twitter, too, and Facebook. <laughs> but don't dox me, please. But don't dox her. Thank you so much, Judith. Really appreciate your time Thanks, today. Thanks, Pete. Thanks. It was closer. There she goes, Judith Manloff. Go get that book. It's really fascinating. She's a great guest. She made me feel a lot better uh, talking to her, too. I I hope that you did as well. Like I said, I didn't want to scare people, but I I do think preparing, not being a prepper, but preparing just a little bit. I got to go get that uh, wind-up weather clock. Does anybody have one of those? Okay, so my next guest is one of my best friends in the whole world. He was a regular guest, one of the few on the old show. He joined me every Friday, and for whatever reason, we haven't been able to get it together to get him on the podcast. But uh, I figure I wait till uh, episode 155 to get one of my best friends and former regular guests on the show. We've both been through a lot, as have so many of you over the past few months. And uh, Mark held my hand all the way through my uh the situation at Sirius XM, and uh, he's uh, been a very, very good friend to me. Really, one of the best, one of the closest, always there for me. I love him to death, and it's always great to talk to him. And the top of our conversation didn't, uh, there was something wrong with, uh, technically, with his microphone, but we got it fixed. And so we start in the middle of the conversation, Mark and I, where I was telling him about my shed studio. That seems like it's the only thing I talk about. Mark, by the way, of course, is the vice president of political and special events programming and senior political analyst at CNN. You can find him at SiriusXM hosting Full Stop with Mark Preston every week on SiriusXM POTUS Channel 124. And tweet him at Preston CNN. Here's my conversation with Mark Preston, beginning with our uh, Shed Studio Solar Power Talk. Did you put solar on top no, of it? No, but I'm thinking, why not? Like, I'm thinking I, I can do that later, like something... Um, Stand alone. I'm not sure how to do that. If anybody listening can help me with that, and a lot of people have, they probably can't. Like just a couple panels. Yeah, I don't know why I didn't think of that. So I can tell you, I can tell you how to do it. Although oh, really? I haven't done it yet. Is that I bought I bought two uh, solar panels of two hundred two hundred oh, watts really? each. So it's four hundred. Do you hook? Up, you didn't hook them up yeah, yet. Yeah, so it's four hundred watts. No, but I have the whole kit to do it because I mean, I mean, it's very simple, but it's also like I mean, you have to have all the pieces. So you have to have obviously the solar panels. Then you have to have a charge connector. What what, what, charge what will connector. you use it for? So I bought it um, because uh, you know I have a camp for the summer and fall out on a river, you know, where I live, just to get away. You know, there's no vacations for us, so. So it was just a, um, a place we rented, you know, for a couple of months, just like a little camp. And I thought that having solar out there uh, would be really helpful when it comes to, you know, like, because there's no electricity, you know, so it's boondocking, basically. So that the solar would help, um, you know, either power like the air conditioner or something like that. And so you don't have to run the generator 24-7. Yeah, let me know if you get that. A rich, a, a, a rich person problem. By the way, I'll, I'll tell you where to get it. I mean, you just go to Renergy. I mean, that's where I bought it. I mean, you know, no plug for that company, but I think that they're one of the best. All right. I, I, Pretty easy. I don't know why. I'm sure people are going to react to this conversation because a lot of people have done that. It doesn't look that hard. Um, the hardest thing I've – have you ever – do you know what an inter, uh, a Cat5 cable is? Basically an, an Ethernet, and Internet cable. It looks like a phone, a cat uh, like an old, you know, like a phone uh, out. The, 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 an internet cable. Yeah. yeah. So you, I, I bought one for like with the 200 feet because I had to drag the internet out there. And you right. have to put the uh, plugs on, on either end of it. There are eight wires and you have to slip them in the plastic holder. And I swear to God, nothing's ever been harder in my life. Talking about you slice the wiring and and then you and basically then you just t- yeah you take off the cord and you, it's it's really hard if anybody can tell me how to do that as well. So I have a question: Why are you uh, why are you dragging a hard line out there? Why aren't you just repeating a, a signal? You can, off because of your... you can't Wi Fi interviews because if you lose right. one word blip, it's really annoying and frustrating. Yeah, I got you. You know, no, when no, you're doing audio, which is primarily what I'm doing, much less video, I lose a word. It's it's a nightmare. 
um, in, in the po in the edit or just as a listener, if I can't fix it, you know, so it's, it's just, uh, you got to have the, uh, the hard line for this stuff, I think. Yeah, makes sense. And I always did in my old studio, but, but yeah, you can, uh, apparently it does fine in the weather. So how are you dealing with work in terms of physically, you, you, you don't, have, do you, have you been, you generally report to the. Uh, I mean, you travel a lot, obviously, for CNN. But you generally, your office is at the Washington bureau. Have you gone in? Do you go in? So I have been in. Um, I mean, I mean, I'll just tell you j- just quickly. I was running this story earlier <clears throat> with a former colleague um, of mine uh, who no longer works at CNN, but you know, was asking basically the same question uh, earlier today of me, and I said, you know. I go, let me just paint this picture. A week before the last presidential debate, which was uh, like right after Super Tuesday, uh, the mayor of Phoenix um, was in the health commissioner, was basically trying to convince us that Arizona was a safe place to come into in COVID, you know. Now, in their defense, nobody knew what was really going on around them, but we knew something was going on. So uh, we ended up not holding the debate in Arizona, and we held the debate, became, in some ways, uh, it, it became kind of like a punctuation point at the end of of, of real stuff, um, or real life as we knew it when that debate happened, I think, because we saw these two presidential candidates who had been out on the campaign trail. It really was coming uh, to an end for Bernie Sanders, but uh, there was an agreement that this one last debate should happen so Bernie Sanders could at least make a pitch for his for his ideals. So this debate happens. Um, and then basically, if you, if you look back, it was that weekend, um, maybe it was the 14th, I guess it was around then that, uh, that the, the country really shut down. So, so we did that debate and I just kind of remember after the debate sitting around and, and looking at Joe Biden and, and, uh, and Bernie Sanders, and we were practicing all these protocols and all that, you know, even then, which I think was really, I mean, it was smart of us, but I also think set an example for others. But I just, I just remember looking, being like, what the hell just happened here, you know? Um, and everybody left, and it, and it really reminds me of that scene in, in MASH, you know, <laughs> the final scene where they, where they all leave, right? Yeah. right? Everybody leaves on a different vehicle. So, so that happens, and then I'll speed it up. I was in the office the next couple of days, because obviously, you know, because I'm a uh, been around a while, so I would have to go in and, and help them a little bit. So we did that, and then uh, I hadn't been in since the Fourth of July. So hmm. um, while the focus has been so much on politics, and you know, that's my, you know, that's my realm. Uh, it's also on special events. So we produced a couple of other big events outside of politics because um, that's not where the nation was. You know, there it has been for the past you know, three months, you know, we were running these town halls on CNN that have to do with the pandemic or have to do with race. But those are all built, you know, by other groups now within CNN and CNN. I helped create what we're now doing elsewhere, which is fantastic. But we also decided that we needed to do some other things just because politics wasn't um, it wasn't just policy town halls, which is what I normally do, right. or presidential debates or whatever they have. You know, we decided to do a graduation special, you know, for all the kids who didn't uh, get a graduation. And we were able to add an extra hour onto one that was already being produced uh, by LeBron James. And we worked in collaboration with his team to do a two hour special around the country. And we did a Fourth of July special, which was interesting because it's kind of a tough tightrope to walk. A lot of people celebrating independence, a lot of people. You know, saying that they don't feel independent, yeah. and rightfully so. You it was know, a different tone this year, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it was a, definitely a different tone, and it, it was, I'll tell you, it was an interesting tightrope to walk, um, knowing what you're, what we were dealing with. But I got to tell you, in, in the end, I think it worked out really, really well. And so that's what we've been doing. I, well, I mean, basically, I'm, it's it's interesting. Not necessarily working in an office, um, and I haven't been on TV much because uh, I'm not a doctor. Uh, I'm certainly not going to go out and be able to tell you, uh, we know what's safe or what's not safe. I would just be parroting what my colleagues would, you know, my medical colleagues would be telling me. And I don't think there was really any, any, any desire for a political analysis. I think people were making their own analysis over the actions uh, and, and judgments made by our leaders. Wow, that was a long speech. Uh, we'll I have a few questions based on it. Um, is it true that you wear a mask with a hole in it for your mouth to breathe? Uh, uh, well, well uh, uh, half true. Um, <laughs> three holes because I also have my nostrils. Too I got nailed. Now. I went to Best Buy yesterday. 
And uh, when I was walking in, my mask was had just I had one of these masks that like keeps slipping down. It's like my uh, my back bench, my it's backup mask that I usually don't use because yeah, 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 like, yeah, fits the girls, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. And uh, and it kept and it was like not over my nose, and I wasn't one step in. Like, sir, please put that over your nose. I was like, oh, I'm sorry. Oh, I'll tell you a story. You want a story? I'm going to one up you here. Go arms. ahead. Because that one so, wasn't that so good. I was, it shouldn't uh, be too hard. It wasn't that good. <laughs> I mean, I was like, seriously, I, I went out the other day and the clerk said to me, have a nice day. I was like, thank you so much. You have a nice day. And I was just, I mean, no. So I was out and I was, uh, I was in a, uh, I was in a different part of the state this weekend and, uh, and saw a confrontation between a sheriff and uh, somebody outside of a big box store because they're, you know, refused to wear a mask. I, and they knew their rights. I, oh, yeah. I saw um, If I see one of those videos, I get, and that's not good. I'm not proud of this, but I love, I can't wait for those videos of people being confronted and, and, and then being offended and losing their minds over having to be forced to wear a mask. Like, I don't know why. But, I mean, you're saying you witnessed it in real life, in person. When I see those videos, and for some reason they're always on rawstory.com, probably because they're good at clickbait, but I love them. They're super troubling, but I'm fascinated by people uh, protesting that as somehow an well, infringement or, or in any way. I just I don't. Dude, go spend some time outside one of these big box stores on a Saturday or yeah. Sunday. You're bound to see it. Well, I mean, not here. I feel like in New point. York, like I haven't heard anecdotally doesn't mean anything. But I, I don't know. I mean, I think it's regional, cultural to some you extent. You haven't seen you haven't seen uh, you haven't seen police officers out at these um, at these big box. Stores? I haven't. You I haven't, seen I haven't really maybe been to any. I've been to Home Depot, but I haven't seen anything. I haven't seen law enforcement, and I haven't seen any issues. People wear their masks, wow. and and that's that's that. Where I where, and I've been out a lot. I go out a lot. Uh, grocery stores, um, you know, hardware stores, stuff like that. Best Buy, like I said, I, I've not seen anybody giving anyone a problem. But that doesn't mean anything. I mean, it happens. It's just, it's. A, I don't. I I had try to relate to other people as much as I can. Understand where they're coming from. This whole not wearing mask thing is bizarre to me. Bizarre. I don't. I don't. Uh, well, I mean, I just. I mean, no, no, no. Here's the thing. Look at I get it. People are like, look, I don't have enough money for a mask, right? I saw somebody at one of these. Big don't have enough stores. money for a mask. Just listen. I'm giving the uh, whole. Okay. I'm, I'm 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 pulling away uh, like the last stupid argument. Why should I go out and buy one? Okay, so I, I saw there was a there was a person you know working for the big box store sitting outside with those disposable masks you know that everybody buys that are like fifty bucks a box. If you wanted to go in, you had to wear one of those. Like you know, gave it to you. You know, now they don't have to do that, but they do it. Um, so, you know, the argument that, oh, it's, you know, you're forcing me to buy something that I don't need or yada, yada, yada is ridiculous. Right. I also love the health issues, by the way, the, my doctor said that I shouldn't be, um, I, you, you know, that yeah. I shouldn't have a mask on. It's like, really? Like, like what? The doctor that went viral from that Trump video, Oh God! you, you know, that they sent out who, did you read the story in the daily beast about that doctor? Um, I read a Daily Beast story today, like maybe not about that a specific doctor, but a, I don't know. The, that group of doctors um, was is, is anti-vaxxers. They're anti-vax people, doctors. There are a plenty of, not plenty, but too many doc- physicians that are, you know, anti-science. And well, uh, the president tweeted or shared a video that had been taken down. By Twitter and his son, Don Jr.'s Twitter account got suspended today. You hear? Well, right, be, be, right, right, because what it was is, is that this doctor, and I'm, I'm going to do it in you know, not enough justice, and, and if you're listening, go to the Daily Beast, read the story. Very well done. Daily Beast does a really good job, I think, um, uh, oftentimes of, of covering politics and, and kind of giving it a, a little bit of an edge to it. But I will tell you this, th- this story about, about this doctor – uh, she, she believes in like uh, a demons and Satan, uh, a demons having sex with you um, in your dreams. And that like causes like like cysts and stuff. like Yeah, that. I believe, but I think like, there's some merit to that. Well, there if is. But I mean, here's the problem. Part of the deep state. And that kind of I mean, there's a large percentage of Trump supporters that are QAnon supporters and that believe 
and this global pedophile ring. And now they've taken it to a new, this is becoming more and more uh, uh, widely held, which is the, the craziest that they're also uh, George Soros and the Clintons and other names. They're eating uh, babies for their, their blood that keeps them living forever or something like that's now, if you, if you pitch that as a Hollywood screenplay, you know, Hollywood would be like, ah, no, too campy. It's too silly. But a, like a frighteningly like large a percentage 1980s. of Americans are, are believing right. this stuff and acting and acting well, upon it. There are, there are, there are candidates, um, Republican candidates like nominees who are QA several supporters. Several. Who, yeah. I've talked about know, it. Who p- potentially could win. Yeah. You know, and, and, and come to Congress. What's dangerous about that is that uh, people think that, that any concern that UNA may, might be expressing right now has to do with politics and has zero to do with politics. It has to do with, you know, somebody openly pushing a, uh, uh, a narrative that's just. Well, I disagree. It's, and false. it's completely political because the president of the United States, the leader of the Republican Party, is the, is the leading spreader of conspiracy theorists and has been before no, he got into politics no. like he he right, made right, his right, political right. bones on a conspiracy theory about barack obama's birthplace like that's the starting point for donald trump so is it not but i mean maybe it's not yeah, political but, but i think that's it, the definition of it no 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 it is i'm just i'm saying to you well okay but, but i'm saying to you like the basic analysis that people may be hearing right now or how they choose to hear it is not based upon whether, you know, uh, uh, you know, this is a, a Republican thing or whatever. Or at least it's not for me. Right? It's what not I'm trying to say is, trying is, to say is, is that the politics. concern. We're not talking about the role of it's not. Tra- it's not. Tra- right. It's not traditional. Anything. It's just bizarro world. I mean, let's just call it for what it is. Yeah, but I think know, but I think that gives bizarre. I think that gives Republicans uh, a pass because the Republican Party of the last 15 years, I'll say conservatively, has been the party of conspiracy theorists, doesn't theories. It doesn't mean there aren't some liberals or Democrats. But what I always argue is not in office. There aren't Democrats in office who are believing and spreading conspiracy theories. And and that has been mainstream in the Republican Party for far too long, specifically in starting with most probably climate change. It, well, I mean, listen. I mean, l- 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 I mean, f- forget about the 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 the, the fake, you know, uh, nonsense behind, uh, you know, deniers of climate change. But to what you just said a few moments ago, that part of the of of the latest uh, conspiracy theory is that they're eating babies. Yeah. I mean, what else do you need to hear? I mean, seriously. Well, what well, else you, do you need, need to, hear to hear is for the president, every Republican, in any kind of leadership position, be like, "That's insane. We don't believe in that." Oh, we of that. I mean, the last serious Republican in my mind was John McCain, because John McCain shot down the theories about Barack Obama being a foreign-born Muslim, and he, let's be clear, was damaged for being for having integrity. He, it didn't help him that he wasn't crazy enough for them. He was not crazy enough for the Republican Party of two thousand seven. Um, I would say of 2007, you're talking about during the nomination yeah, fight when, when, or, or, when, or, 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 or when he ran against Barack Obama against in 2000, Obama. 2000, right, 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 right. And he, here's the thing. Yeah. He, here's the thing. Oh, this is what I think. He, his, his time he, he, for his candidacy couldn't have come at a worse time, right? We were coming out of an, out of an, out of an, uh, uh, presidency that, um, got very sour. Okay. Towards the very end, people were looking for change. You also saw the economy wasn't. Was I agree totally with you. That's collapsed. fair analysis. However, uh, right. he would have done better with Republicans if he were crazier. So would have Mitt Romney. That's the, 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 oh, the, that's what I, now, I think. It's, had he played to those on the, I don't know if he would have done better electorally. He would have done better with with those folks because he because by doing so, you would he would have turned off what what to your point was, or in some ways that you're making is that he was this this man of his own, right? He was the quote-unquote maverick. Yeah, but Mark, don't you think, I mean, the difference between Fox News and CNN and the reason why they dominate you in ratings is because they're crazy. They have no integrity or responsibility in their reporting. They're absolutely nuts. And that is so infinitely watchable. You're, you're, in the, you're doing journalism. You're doing analysis. There's plenty of criticism of CNN that anybody wants to can weigh in on. But they're not 
crazy people every night, night after night and day after day, believing in crazy conspiracy theories. That's why they they dominate in the ratings. And and that's why the Republican Party needs people uh, to be their nominees at almost every level that are nuts, that are just conspiracy theorists. That's it sells more. It's Wild that any, any any company would advertise on such a network that's that's saying such things, but enough do the my pillow guy. What I would say pillows suck, um, by the way, awful, surprisingly bad. I've never put my head on. Oh, one. they're surprising. It's like a one? it's like a bag full of ice cubes. It's really no good. No, yeah, it's, I could not oh, it's believe cold? that someone would design such a thing. They gave me one for free ten years ago yeah. when I was at Sirius XM to do a live read, and I I remember I was like, it's the last time I think I ever did a live read. I was like, I can't. Can't be advertising this thing. It's a. I know, but I mean, so you didn't like it? it I felt like it was I lying mean, on a I bag of like, Legos. Oh, I got it. Had, like you, got chunks you. It in like it, bumpy. Oh, got you. Shouldn't have said ice. Well, it seems to well, it seems to be uh, doing very well. But regardless, let me just say overall what, what we've seen. You know, certainly in the past ten years. I guess, right? The past decade. It's interesting. Like, it, let me preface by saying that I remember when I was a newspaper reporter and we looked at television and we were a bit snobby, which was hilarious because, you know, we didn't have great jobs. But, you know, we're a bit snobby about the TV thing. And then um, I ended up, you know, leaving newspapers and, and, uh, and, and going to TV. But I remember at the time that there was such a criticism of cable television, the 24 hour news cycle. Look, you've dumbed things down. You know, you, you know you've made things terrible. Well, what we really did is what Ted Turner did back in 1980 is that he really broke the ground on on the democratization on on information, right? Because by us going 24 hours, people were able to see what was really going on around the world. You know, so CNN, obviously not during my time, but, you, you know, back down in, uh, you know, during 1980. So you see what happened over the last decade with social media. You know, we saw a further breakdown of walls and those walls were access and folks being able to go on social media and say what they will and say what they won't, um, which makes no sense because you don't go on social media to say what you won't. But I guess what I'm saying is, is that it allowed people to go out and hear and have their voices heard. Now, we can argue whether or not that's good or bad. I would suggest in the long run, it's good because information is, you know, democracy. It would be kind of nice that if there was more of a policing of it only because we shouldn't be creating highways, our uh, information highways, where people can knowingly peddle false information. I mean, that is detrimental to to mankind. It's crazy uh, that that's allowed. Um, Did you fall asleep? No, Did not at all. Sleep? Sorry, not at all. I'm, I'm I'm trying to think of which direction I want to go with it, but I I do realize that I wanted to go back to something that you said earlier, which was the. The last time you were at CNN, what you're saying, um, not the last time. Was just, oh, Fourth of no, July. No, because, because no before that, right. I just wanted to just say that I thought that the Joe Biden, Bernie Sanders debate in your studio in D.C. was the best debate I'd seen in a long time. And that's because I think it's terrible for democracy, for to get information across, to have an audience. And I think I, I'm not sure, you know, I <laughs> I'm not sure what you, what you think or what programming choices or why they're made, but like it's bad to have an audience. It was so, so much more information, so much less reaction. So I thought it was why. so much better to have no audience. Like you guys did that because right. you had to, but I also think that you should do it moving forward because it was. I, I just thought it was better, better format. They're not playing to the crowd. Thoughts on that? What was the reaction after? Okay, yeah. I mean, the crowd was wild about it. After. it was amazing, <laughs> and the audience. No, here's the thing. Here's the th- this is the whole here's the whole idea about the audience, what have you, folks who are listening right now uh, to your podcast have an interest in politics and have an interest in not necessarily politics, but about how their life is being shaped, right? So, I mean, and, and you've created this community where you have this exchange of ideas, and and it's it's you know you keep focused on the future, you know. But when I say that. There's a lot of folks who aren't focused on the future, and by having an audience, there, there's there's a, there's an electricity that you can bring to an event that brings millions of people to watch it. Now, I will tell you, when I first started working at CNN, I remember when when I really first started helping produce presidential debates, which was in 1996. I mean, 96 because you have to 
be planning basically for, or not 96, rather 2006. Wow, dating myself here, Pete. But 2006, because you have to plan for 2008, because really the debates are 2007, because, you know, that's the primary year where the Democrats, Republicans run against each other. So the reason why I say that is that the ratings at that time, I remember, were just about 2 million viewers for debates that were held in June um, of that year. And uh, if you look at the debate ratings now, um, they're huge, which just goes to show that more people are focused and engaged. But they're not huge because I also don't think, like, honestly, if you put 15 – but by the time you saw Joe Biden and Bernie Sanders on a stage, I have to note this too. You also saw a debate stage that had dramatically shrunk and you hadn't seen them face off one-on-one together. Um, in a way that we had d- during that debate as well. Do I think there should be debates without audiences? Certainly, some of them. But do I think that audiences add uh, something, a level of, of energy? I think that's needed, at least early on in the process, when there's big fields. Yeah, I do, actually. Um, let me ask you about uh, moving along uh, another issue, which is the election itself. Um, first of all, I feel like it's uh, uh, popularly uh, quite a misconception when when people say that the polls were wrong in 2016 about Hillary Clinton and Donald Trump. The polls were actually almost entirely right, is my understanding. It's the Electoral College is how it works. And in a couple of states, there were thin margins where he won, where he probably wasn't supposed to. But they were even those margins were within kind of the the margin of error. So when people say the polls were wrong in 2016, is that an accurate statement? How much nuance does it need? Uh, It's both accurate, but you have to nuance it a little bit because uh, there is some truth uh, to them being wrong. It wasn't the national polls that were wrong. There were some state polls that uh, didn't necessarily pan out. And. Uh, and pollsters got it wrong. Yeah, but I were mean, they wrong? Because- were they weren't they still? I th- I thought they were still within the margin of error. And I also think that it, I, that it matters I, that you factor I, in. And the the question is because moving forward, how much do we dependence do we put on polling? That's where the question lies in any conversation, much right. less in political science in general. And I my feeling is when you factor in that they were within the margin of error, which I might be wrong about, but also there was a lot of voter suppression, or at least enough in Wisconsin. And Michigan is my understanding that it made a big difference in the outcome in those states uh, that 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 we should. My, my point is, we should absolutely consider the polls. Uh, they they are they're not uh, uh, modeled or fashioned in, in a, especially in the aggregate. Right. Like, I feel like we should still look at them and, and consider them to be accurate. Okay, so how about this? I was talking to Stu Rothenberg, who is the senior editor over at Inside Elections. He used to run the Rothenberg Political Report. He's the handicapper of uh, political elections. So we're talking last week, and uh, and the CNN poll of polls had Joe Biden up 12 points. What that means is that CNN had its own poll. I forget what uh, what the exact margin of the CNN poll was. Um, but when the, But when CNN has its own poll, in addition to its own singular poll, we will also... Um, release within a day or so, like uh, a poll of polls, you know, depending on if there's enough of them. And what that is, is an average of, you know, the last six polls that CNN <clears throat> considers um, uh, legitimately mathematically produced. legitimately, yeah, right? right? Le- le- re- correct. Okay. So the reason why I say this is that they had, uh, so we had them at, tw- at, at 12, basically, through this average. And I asked Stu, and Stu said, uh, I don't know if 12, he goes, I think it could be eight or nine. He goes, 10 maybe. Um, but I don't think it's 12. He goes, but the bottom line is, is that Donald Trump right now, if the election's held today, like Donald Trump loses. So to your point, the polls um, in some of the states were wrong. Overall, uh, the polls weren't wrong. And to your point about how we pick um, how we pick our president, you know, we we pick it in a way that that a lot of people don't think is equally distributed. Well, it's yeah, the electoral the college is a vestige of, of slavery, right. really. I mean, it's I think it's pretty inherently racist and and uh, speaking and of slavery. Yes. Speaking of slavery, let me interject. There's a story, I think it's in the Washington Post today or yesterday. 
this week sometime where 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 a son of a of a slave is like still alive and like tells the stories um tells some of the stories of, of that his father told uh when he was like 5 years old i think i think his father died when he was like 6 years old or something hmm. like that but Wow, what a crazy! I mean, it's 2020, you know, and you know we think of uh, of the Civil War and all that being like eons ago. It wasn't that long ago? Well, it's interesting to hear all this conversation about history uh, because we 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 didn't talk about that history for years, and now, and it's a weird thing for people to be. There's a lot of people from Tom Cotton to Mike Pence to obviously Trump and others who are being extremely. Uh, unkind to that version of history, which is a version that we were not told because it's shameful. And like you, you have to tell all of history and, and it's crazy to not be, it's crazy to ignore one part of it or to not hear from the people who lost, you know, as uh, I think Bill Barr said weeks ago, he's like, you know, how will history remember you? And he's like, well, that depends on who wins because history is generally, written by the winners, I, I, I suppose. But it, is, it, it seems very weird for uh, Tom Cotton or Mike uh, Pompeo or Donald Trump to be so uh, disdainful to things like the 1619 Project at the New York Times or to just talking about our shameful past. Like, why can we not talk about our horrific, shameful past and how this country was founded? Like, that's not a, a, a worthy conversation. You know, I was saying this to a prominent Democrat the other day. I said, uh, who's, you know, involved with the election. And I said, you know, I said, Donald Trump right now should be killing you guys. I go, and just think, when this pandemic hit, all he had to do was write a check and be supportive. That's all you have to do as a president. Just be supportive, write a check, basically let, you know, your advisors who are experts in their fields do their job, right? That's what a CEO does. I said, but he just couldn't get out of his own way. He just couldn't get out of his own way. Because in the end, as much as they're fighting, we know they're fighting over the stimulus right now, you know, and how they're going to move forward. In the end, you know, that check's going to get written. You know, it's going to get written, you know, for what extent, for how much money the check's going to be written for, who knows, but Washington Congress is going to pass. You know what I mean? So I, so again, you never, what was it, Ron Manuel said, you never let a good uh, crisis go to waste or whatever, something like yeah. that. Donald Trump, I mean, could have been, like, could you imagine if he was just projecting some leadership? No, and I not can't. Doing, like, crazy no, things? I can't. No, I know. I'm just saying, like, I said, could you imagine? Yeah, I know, because, but he never, he never has. He's never, and here's why. And this is what I wish, I don't know, maybe you, you'll disagree with this, but I wish everybody would just acknowledge what is the most obvious thing about this man and what has always been obvious about this man, according to almost every person who has ever worked closely with this man? He doesn't care about anyone. He doesn't care about anybody, which is a very weird thing. I don't think that's true of almost any other politician, even some of the most corrupt. They, they at least pretend to care and vote for certain things. This this man is is it has a psychological impairment. That does not allow him to have empathy for anyone. And I mean, including his family. Like it's on. I don't think I've ever heard of anybody like this, but he's always been that way. And so how can you be the president of the United States and not care about anybody in your country? He seems to care more about, you know, horrible world leaders in other countries than just average people struggling in his own country, much less leaders in his own country. He has been more friendly to Vladimir Putin than he was to John Lewis. Fair? Uh, it appears so. It in appears terms of rhetoric, so. Yeah, just I in mean, terms of the things he says about him. You know? Uh, yeah, sure. Yeah, no, I yeah. guess I can't argue on that, of course. No reason to argue. Crazy. I mean, is John yeah, Lewis... I don't know. John Lewis, the greatest living... Like, he's obviously passed. One of the greatest Americans to ever live, right? Well, I mean, uh, let me put it in... in you know, of in, our in lifetime. Well, that's what I was going to say. So, so if you look around right now and say who are like really true heroes, you know, John Lewis is a true hero, right? He was a, a classic true hero. And you look at uh, you know some of the folks, the, the Medal of uh, uh, of you know War recipients, you, you know, Medal of Honor, who, Medal of Honor, excuse me. Um, you know, you look at them and you say they are true heroes. And then beyond that, like who are the heroes? 
I, I don't know. I mean, Paul Newman. Any, do you have a nomination? I mean, he did create a whole food line, Dude, right? That goes. Do you to, uh, do you uh, buy any of those products from the Newman's Own? Sure. Uh, there's not a there's not a Newman's Own product that I don't like. The lemonade and the dressing. It, it, it is good. Yeah. Well, he's got good salsa too. I mean, it's I all good. For, you know, obviously. nonprofit. So good. Yeah. Paul Newman. I miss him too. Um, all right. So what do you uh, what do you think about what are your concerns? If you have concerns, I'm leading you about the sanctity about of of our election and the the health of our democracy. I think that it's going to be very trying for the next six to eight months. Yeah. And I think that the hard struggle for the next six to eight months on the other side of it will we will come out much, much better. That's what I think. Yeah, I think that's good that you said six months because we're so focused, and I always am, on November 3rd. But Donald Trump will be in power until January 20th. Well, but it's all, yeah, and it might even be, and maybe say the, the eight months, right? Because then, you know, you have Congress and, you know, like who knows what's going to happen there. But, you know, you have to assume that if you were to base on the polls right now, Democrats would take control of Washington, basically. The, yeah, everything I've seen is that they have a very good likely shot of taking over the Senate, which was not the case up maybe up, uh, as recent as a year ago. Yeah, not the case at all. Not the case. But even the House uh, Democrats are probably going to lose a few seats if, if you know, if he was going to win or if he does win again. I mean, they could lose a few seats. I mean, basically. But I will tell you, uh, it, it, the flip side is happening now that if you do see Biden when you are going to see the, you know, you, you will see some other Democrats that will win that normally wouldn't have won. And that's the whole coattail effect. Right. When people talk about that. Yeah, you're right. Yeah. The coattails. Are the down ballot. Yeah. Line. If you had to. Uh, this is the worst question because we're going to find out. It's one of those weird questions that who cares because we'll find out soon. But still, who would you uh, yeah. put your money on for his VP candidate? Oh, VP. Um, you know, I think uh, I think it's hard. It's hard for anyone but Kamala Harris, I think. Uh, and, and the reason, one of the reasons I say that is because – uh, she has cut herself as an, a national profile. She has been in under the heat and the glare. She doesn't look like she's a yes woman, mm. right, right, at all. Yeah. Uh, and by indications of uh, of her uh, criticizing Joe Biden during one of the debates. And uh, I also think that, like, and this is probably, like, one of the most important ones, is that in many ways she's been vetted you know, over the past year. So there's, I don't know how many surprises we would find out about Kamala Harris. Now, if somebody else is picked, um, you know, part of the next month, right? Six weeks is going to be like, what can we find out about X, Y, and Z, right? I mean, you know, either they're going to go and try to dig up dirt on, uh, when I say this, they, I mean, every journalist, right? Every political journalist, there's not many other stories out there. We'll go try to find out about that person. There could be some damaging stuff in, in people's past that they've been able to to push through and move beyond, but not something that they want to bring up, you know, publicly. Like, I, I don't know. I mean, I, I'm just so it, it will be very interesting. I think if it's Kamala Harris, I think a lot of the drama about the unknown is is uh, is immediately dissipated. Yeah. Yeah. Does that make sense? Or yeah, no, I think it's a, a Yeah. I mean, I, when you're saying that she's been vetted enough, it's a, I'm like, what could they find that would be like? Politics is so Trump changed everything like oh, things that are used anything. to be like a gaffe or or, you know, and bear, like an affair. It's like, uh, I guess that doesn't matter. I mean, this guy paid off <laughs> a porn star to be, you know, I mean, while he had an affair on his current wife, he had affairs on all of his wives. Yeah, so it's like, yeah, all right. Yeah. Yeah. But although, you know, oh, but, 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 what they I hold will him say, to a though, different standard. Yeah. Correct. What 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 happened in 2016 and perhaps 2020 is not going to be the same standard that another Republican, let alone any Democrat, is going to be held to unless that Republican is one of his children. And I think that, you know, like the Don Jr., you know, there could be that standard. Right. You know, he could be held up to that. But all right. No more speculation. I'll let you go. Thank you very much for talking to me. Welcome to the podcast. Great to finally get you on episode one one thousand five hundred and forty. I'm sorry. I'm so glad. I feel like I'm, uh, you know, I get picked for the uh, the kickball game. You know, twelve years after I fifth grade. <laughs> That's a good analogy. But thank you. It was it was really well. Fun. I'm sure you were nervous to do it, and I'm, I'm, it must be feel good to get it out of the way. First one. Yeah, it's like uh, it's like that foreigner song. Cue it.
I don't, I don't know that song. That I'm going to find it and play it on the way out of this interview. So, All right. Thank you, Mark Thank you, Preston. Right, pal. Follow Mark on Twitter and everything else that I'm supposed to say after I press stop. Thank you, sir. Yeah, that's Mark Preston. At Preston CNN coming at you. Forwarder. Feels like the first time, everybody. <laughs> All right, that's it. <clears throat> It's a good tune. Thank you very much for tuning in. Don't forget to email me your ideas for the stand-up community you're going to help me build. I'm excited to work with you. And um, I can't talk over the lyrics. Anyway, if you're not a paid subscriber to this podcast, please consider it now. Patreon.com slash Pete Dominic. Or just click on the paid subscription link in the show notes. Thank you for listening, everybody. No, you're not alone. And I know I'm not either. I got you. And for the first time in a long time, feeling real good about it. I don't know. I just wanted to say that because you kept saying first time. Sorry. (laughs) Talk to you tomorrow.